global emergency, who pushed the button? America and China, what's behind the Far West Pact? Electronic warfare, how can you do it on the cheap? Good evening. Reports are coming in of a serious alert of the SDN, the West Strategic Defense Network. American early warning computers in Colorado sounded the alarm today when they apparently detected the launch of a major Soviet offensive. According to sources close to the Pentagon, signals were sent to armed nuclear missiles stationed in the United States, Europe, the Far East and Australia. All strike aircraft have been ordered to leave their bases. Two days ago, you wouldn't have been able to hear me for the sound of planes taking off. Today, the excitement's over. This is all that's left. A lone tornado. Are we at peace? Are we at war? In my world, like in yours, these things are only talked about behind closed doors. We're still here. That's a hopeful sign. A White House spokesman has accused the Soviet Union of upsetting the strategic balance by interfering with the West's electronic defences. An official announcement from Moscow blames Washington for whipping up what it calls bellicose hysteria. It says the Soviet Union will not stand idly by. The Secretary General of the United Nations has urged representatives of both sides to meet without delay. To know what really happened, you'd have to be able to see 6,000 miles west into the system control center deep under the Rocky Mountains. Happened, you'd have to look 10,000 miles east to the Pacific Ocean. It's still the same old enemy, though. Have you checked the system through for any sign of a malfunction? Well, there's got to be an explanation. Has somebody loaded one of those damn full war game things? Good, into the valley, please. Back action time, zero, zero, two. Sir, we have an unknown Zulu four, Listen, four, Cretton, five. there's no way you're going to make me believe the Reds have launched. We're in a period of relative detente, goddammit. Those guys in the Kremlin aren't fools. Confirm your air base. In my world, it isn't fools, or even generals, or presidents, or kings, or chairman of the Presidium who declare war. It's machines. Fittingly enough, Dr. Strangelove was showing at the Capitol Hill Cinema in Washington on June the 6th, when a false alarm of a Soviet missile attack, the second in a week and the third in seven months, started the countdown for a nuclear strike against Russia. A world in which war really did turn out to be too important to leave to the generals. And the opponents don't face each other across Europe anymore. In the information age, whoever controls the technology controls the world. 
So the axis of the world has shifted. Once power was concentrated around the Atlantic Ocean. America one side, Europe the other. Now it's the Pacific. California and Australia. Japan, the world's richest industrial nation. China, trying to build the first Marxist-Leninist consumer society. Wake up to the new force in the world. America's know-how, Japan's industry, Australia's minerals, China's markets. Look west, America. Now there's a new frontier. I expect the Romans were just as surprised to find their empire crumbling away. Maybe the Egyptians, too. My name is Ozymandias, king of kings. Look on my works, ye mighty, and despair. We've had an easier time of it. The Pacific runs a completely new kind of economic empire. When Britain ruled the waves, we didn't just export our goods, we pressed our fashions on them our religions, our morals. The goods we exported were part of a whole way of life. The East has conquered us with the products of our own technology. What's your story? Compensation. What? Fifteen years I sang their company song. What happened? When one of the gates was locked and they're gone. What, the Korea or New Guinea or somewhere? Or oh, here? No, I'm not. I'm working my way down, getting back what I'm old. This is my age. Oh, I see. It's the 29th site. What are you looking for? Gold. Look, see that? that 20 microns, that is. What's it worth? The development of new technologies and the industrial power which flows from them are causing a fundamental realignment of global power structures. New conflicts arise for which our history has done little to prepare us. The basic conflict is between the Soviet Asia Alliance and the Pacific Basin Alliance. Now the Pacific Basin Alliance itself uh, is important in so far as it includes America, Australia, Japan, as well as China. The relations between America and China started to improve considerably in the late 1970s. In fact, in 1979, the Chinese allowed the American Central Intelligence Agency to have two listening posts in southern China near the Soviet border to monitor Soviet weapons testing sites. And from there, of course, in 19, 1985, uh, there were joint uh, exercises between um, American and Chinese Navy of the Vietnamese coast. In 1986, the Chinese bought uh, advanced avionics from uh, the Americans for the F-8 fighter planes, and from there the relations grew much stronger. On the other side was the Soviet Asia Alliance, and that actually was the combination of two bilateral alliances that the Soviet Union had. One was the Soviet Vietnam Alliance, which came about in the 1970s, and the other one had to do with the Soviet India Alliance, which came about in 1971. And when the revolution, the Marxist revolution, took place in the Philippines in the 1990s, soon after the revolution, uh, the People's Republic of the Philippines joined the Soviet Asia Alliance. So in the early 21st century, that's where the two alliances were opposed to each other. In this kind of a world, it doesn't matter how far away you stay from trouble. Nowhere is far enough. It took less than a third of a second 
It took hardly any longer for the alarm to reach Colorado from the Pacific. This is a world in which nobody can see enough and know enough, or is smart enough and quick enough to beat the electronic reflex. The goal of our research is completely autonomous land, sea and air vehicles capable of complex, far-ranging reconnaissance and attack missions. In contrast with previous computers, the new generation will exhibit human-like intelligent capabilities for planning and reasoning. Over the past 50 years, we've seen fighter aircraft grow more complex and heavier, higher performance. In fact, uh, uh, the, the, the Tornado, which is at the end of its useful service in the Royal Air Force, is as heavy as a World War II Lancaster, even though it's only got uh, two crew. The more sophisticated systems in the aircraft cater more for detecting airborne threats at a very great distance, assigning priorities to the threats and combating them with the weapons that are available. And this is more of a battle management task than the classic dogfight, spitfire type uh, air combat role. Okay. The unmanned aircraft is perhaps half the size, a third the weight. So it has a very much smaller radar cross section. It's more agile. In fact, a human pilot would find difficulty in uh, staying conscious in, in the manoeuvres that this can uh, undergo on demand if necessary. So, where are the men of war today? Not at the guns, in tanks or planes. Too many dollars, rubles, pounds have been invested in their brains to have them throw their lives away, consumed by flames. So, where are the men of war this year? Not on the battlefield where fate rules on the side of the machines and silicon and armor plate fight without ever knowing fear or hate. Once you're actually flying off the ground, what can a human pilot and navigator do that, that a computer can't do? Basically, we are monitoring the whole time. Primarily to keep the equipment updated, such that we can reach our destination or target as accurately as possible. Um, secondly, and almost as important, is while you're doing that, is to keep your eyes out of the cockpit, uh, looking for hostile aircraft, or anything that may threaten yourself. This aircraft has a fly-by-wire system as its primary control system. Uh, so for normal flying, although the stick is connected to rods and levers, it's not that that's being used. But this one does have a mechanical backup, and it's a stable airplane. Uh, so if the electrics or the computer fails, then you can still fly it. Hmm. Now, the later generations of aircraft, being totally unstable, rely on the computer. We're really only just seeing the introduction into service of fully automated, remotely piloted aircraft for combat roles, and in some senses, the pilot's still more versatile than a computer program. But he is sitting in a four-ton truck somewhere remote from the action, and there is a direct data link between imaging sensors on the aircraft and a TV system in the control vehicle. However, the aircraft may well be on its own under the control of its onboard computer for large parts of the mission, flying between waypoints on a map or perhaps orbiting over a battle area, um, getting general intelligence back for gunnery or, or short-range missile attack. We've seen the development of electronics 
since World War II, not just in military systems, but as a way of controlling the world, which are images like, like television. And one might well say, well, we've got information here which is in, in the form of light, optical information. It's possible to keep it in the form of light, image processing with optics. Military systems in the uh, 1980s were reaching towards this goal of optical signal processing where one might, for example, store in holographic form the image of an enemy tank as seen from all possible aspects. And the optical processing system would take in from the outside world sensor information from the television, electronically turn that into holographic imagery, compare the holographic image received from the real world with the target image, and when the correlation was achieved, turn on then some rather more humdrum electronic device which would home in on the, the enemy target and destroy it with a conventional weapon. testing the latest technology is happening now at Edwards Air Force Base. But flight testing is just part of the high-tech story. Tomorrow's technology is being researched and developed in Air Force Systems Command laboratories today. One thing seems absolutely clear to me, and that is that automated warfare is sheer lunacy. Let me give you a technical view of why, why this might be so. If you program a machine to deliver victory, that's the first thing it's going to do. But then if it can't deliver victory, what it might do is to deliver total destruction or destruction on a very large scale before it will submit to the other side. That must be the nature of its program. Now, take two such machines playing one against the other. It's very hard to predict who's going to win that, that sort of situation. It's a bit like giving a ball to a seal so that the seal can balance in, on its nose. Seals are quite good at doing this, but at the end of the day, the seal gets tired or some wind knocks the ball off the seal's nose. That's known as an unstable situation, and two warlike machines are in an unstable situation. At this moment, like at every other moment, men in secret underground bunkers are standing by to announce a day of judgment. Out in space, 10,000 machines are screaming war. During one 18-month period, the North American Air Defense reported 150 serious false alarms four of which resulted in B-52 bomber crews starting their engines. Missile crews and submarine commanders were placed on high alert. The systems are very fragile. The more elaborate the technology, the more prone it is to fail of its own accord. The fault may be human. A technician loads a wrongly labeled training tape into the data banks of the battle management machine. The fault may be physical. A burnt out chip worth less than a paperclip. The fault may be in software, an undetected error in an unexplored byway of a controlling program, determined to translate a flight of geese into a missile swarm. So we've had to learn to shut off a label of alerts and near misses. Twice a week on average, the world teeters on the edge of destruction, and these days it doesn't take much to upset the balance of power. Sources close to the Pentagon believe that the major emergency this week was the result of a breach in the Strategic Defense Network's security. Intelligence reports from Southeast Asia suggest that Islamic guerrillas operating away from their bases on the island of Mindanao may have been responsible. It is thought that they have overrun electronic warfare installations left behind by the United States after the Philippine Revolution. The Philippine People's Army is seeking out the insurgents who oppose the Soviet-backed Manila government. They are supported by the Pacific Basin Alliance. 
Now, the powerful forces of uh, America, Japan, China, and Australia did not like the idea of having this one Marxist revolutionary state, you know, within their in their own backyard, uh, as so as to say, and wanted to destabilize it. And they saw a chance of reviving the Muslim movement, which wanted to break away from the central authority of the government in Manila. And so this particular movement uh, went into a higher gear and took the form of insurgency. Illegal acts, with the help of computer systems or against them, involve sabotage, espionage, and terrorism with some political aim. In the future, such acts may become a means of aggression between states, apart from conventional wars. Global war in the 21st century is machine against machine, logic against logic, censor against censor, a battle of algorithms with people as the prize. No place for heroes or martyrs here. They get in the way of the objective analysis of the game plan. The minimax evaluation in the alpha beta search of the decision tree. Of course, people still get killed. There are those who will always pit their wits and their strength of their convictions against overpowering forces. Today is taking on a new face. The Americans and the Soviets have invested billions of dollars in high technology military equipment. But whatever they do, they can never overcome three things which are always working in our favor. One, the more sophisticated is technology, the more vulnerable to sabotage. Two, the more complex is security the more possible to infiltrate. Three, the more elaborate is the attack and defense system, the more possible to look it up. What we can do is manipulate the killing ground. They want to trap us in a free fire zone where they can use their machines freely. We only fight in heavy populated places, in the cities, historic districts. There are satellite pictures, movement detectors, autonomous search and destroy vehicles are all useless. They cannot operate in such places, but we can turn their own technology against them. Got the one. Well, we could probably use the existing surveillance equipment to carry out a passive electronic eavesdrop on the message transmission. We could probably inject some disinformation into the data transmission to confuse the controller in his surveillance network. We could also bring down the uh, picture from the satellites uh, to analyze uh, the facts but of course, they would be encrypted, and uh, we would need to find the proper key to decode the information. But as you know, the weakest link in security is the human beings, and it would not be difficult to obtain the code from them. In terms of this insurgent organization nowadays, you really have to have data communication specialists. Small enough to carry through the woods, powerful enough to call the satellites in space. There'll always be some friendly nation to supply the arms and the communications kit, if the cause is a just one. And every cause will seem just to somebody. The guerrillas wanted to plug into the central system 
to see what the overall strategy was. And because that central system was actually plugged into the whole Pacific Basin Alliance system, they actually probably interfered with the global system of the Americans. And so the Americans took this uh, to be a serious threat to their security, and that's why the alert went out. In the olden days, uh, all these conflicts in the Third World are often described as bush wars, and they were localized and didn't really interfere with the balance of power between the two superpowers, that the America and the Soviet Union, but no longer. Because uh, the communication systems have become so integrated globally that even a small bush war, a small conflict in an off-beat uh, island of Mindanao and uh, becomes actually a global affair. Anything, any conflict which is going on anywhere in the world concerns everybody. That's the important thing that we have to keep in mind. Sir, known Zulu 445. Possibilities. No. Can you check on that uh, special no. candidate? No. We don't have the information no. on it yet. No. Hotel. Charlie, Mike, no. zero. Confirm your airbase status no. interface. No. You want to Tactical check on that base? Two, F-106s. Another day, another no. emergency. Zero, zero, two, Thank you very of much. course, they'll take the system no. apart and check every individual link in the chain of command. Find out what went wrong and why. Find out if and where somebody broke into the network. In my world, every problem can be solved by the right technological fix. Do world leaders really believe in automated warfare? One would think it's so idiotic that they don't. Unfortunately, one sees signs of it happening. The Strategic Defense Initiative, for example, does rely on a high degree of automation. And indeed, there wouldn't be time in a situation like that for a human being to even think about what's going on, because things have to happen very fast. So the only way to get out of this, uh, seems to me, to be to dismantle the high technology of warfare and come back to a situation where human judgment is needed to make decisions at the time of the outbreak of war. Human decisions about warfare are pretty irrational anyway. So as to unmake irrational decisions, you do need human judgment, and there's no way one can leave it to a machine. So do we have any other option? When international tension rises, don't you have to protect yourself the best way you can? In the old days, kings and queens and emperors used to avoid war by arranging suitable marriages for their children. In my world, where kings, queens and emperors have long since disappeared, we only have technology left to protect us. So here's to the next time.